I'm Philippe Langella, and I'm Research Director in INRAE. I'm the head of the Laboratory of Common Soul and Probiotics Microorganisms Host Interactions, which is located in Michaelis Institute in Jouy-en-Josas between Paris and Versailles. And today, I will speak about probiotic bacteria, intestinal microbiota, and human health. So the four actors of the food and health concept are the following guys. So Hippocrates was the first to say, from your food, you will make your medicine. And after, the, after this, in 1900, Henry Tissier has discovered bifidobacteria. Then in 1908, Ilya Ilyich Mechnikov was the first to establish a link between the prolonged life of Bulgarian people and the ingestions by these guys of fermented milk called yogurt. So he was the first to uh, hypothesize that Bulgarian bacillus could have good impact on the health of the yogurt consumers as Bulgarian people. After this, in 1953, Werner Collat, which, uh, who was a German microbiologist, was the first to use the term of probiotics in opposition to the term of antibiotics. So Ilya Ilyich Mechnikov is considered now as the creator of the first probiotic food supplement. These probiotic food supplement was called lactobacillin, and it was a kind of uh, lyophilized lactobacilli used to prevent and to fight against intestinal intoxication and intestinal diarrhea. So this guy was very smart because he has already uh, imagined that the probiotic could be used for intestinal disorders. So who are the probiotics? So the probiotics are microorganisms that when administered in adequate amounts, which provide health benefit on the host. And today they are used to prevent pathologies and to maintain in good health humans and animals. So the most popular probiotics are found in lactobacillus, and bifidobacterium. And so you can see that we have several species of each of these bacteria, which are used as uh, probiotics. So Acidophilus, KZI, Johnsoni, Helveticus, Rhamnosus. And for bifidobacterium, it's the same. You have Animalis, Lactis, Brevet. And so we can find also probiotic strains in other bacteria like Streps salivarius, Enterococcus fecalis, Enterococcus fecium, E. coli, Bacillus subtilis, and Propionic bacterium. So I should mention that the effects of these probiotics are strain and matrix dependent. It means that you cannot take any strain of Lactobacillus helveticus, for example, and any strains which uh, will not provide probiotic effects. So you have to screen for the right probiotic strain. And so concerning the efforts which are performed now on probiotics, you can compare the number of publications, scientific publications between 1990 and today in 2020. So in 1990, you can find only 30 publications on probiotics. And today, you can find 30,000 publications on probiotics. It means that you have an increase of 1,000-fold more publications between compared to 1990. And an important point also is that uh, 1,500 human clinical trials have been performed in order to evaluate the beneficial effects of probiotics in humans. Okay. 
So the major health effects of probiotics are the following one, lactose digestions, modulation of human system, modulation of intestinal microbiota, and they could also provide a, an intestinal barrier integrity, and they, can, they could also inhibit pathogens. They are used to prevent and to treat human and animal diseases, for example, irritable bowel syndrome, antibiotics-associated diarrhea, inflammatory bowel disease, obesity, diabetes, autism, all the, the infection of newborn kids by rotavirus, for example, they could be used to prevent and to treat this kind of diseases. So the mode of actions of probiotics are summarized on these slides, and you can see that they could enhance the epithelial barrier, they could inhibit the pathogen adhesion, they could produce antimicroorganism substances, they could have a kind of competitive exclusion of pathogenic microorganisms, they could increase the adhesion to intestinal mucosa, and they could modulate the immune system. And using this mode of action, they could protect against pathogens, they could modulate immune system, they could modulate the composition of intestinal microbiota, they could impact on metabolic functions, and they could play also on the gut-brain axis. So the probiotics in human clinical practices, you can see that they could be ingested using fermented foods or food supplement. And after this, once they are ingested, they will interact with both microbiota and the host. And we should know that the one-size-fits-all probiotics, the universal probiotics, does not exist. And in fact, the clinical effects of probiotics will depend on the strain selected or associated, the dose and duration of administration, and its survival in the digestive tract. So concerning the effects of probiotic, I will have. Uh, I would like to show what happened, for example, in irritable bowel syndrome, uh, and uh, how probiotics could fight against the low-grade inflammation and increased intestinal permeability that we can find in irritable bowel syndrome. And I, I would like to mention that these increased intestinal permeability could be also find, find in newborn kids and uh, young infants, and these probiotics could be used in order to restore a good intestinal permeability, as I will show you on the next slide. So on this next slide, on the right left panel of my slide, you can see the comparison between a normal barrier and one impaired barrier. So such impaired barrier could be found in IBS patients. It could be found also in rotavirus-infected newborn kids. And comparing to the normal barrier, you can see that you have an increase of the permeability of the intestinal barrier, and you will have bacterial products and dietary antigens will cross over the epithelial barrier and will induce immune activation and inflammation. So the probiotics could restore the, the, this status and come back to a normal barrier. So now I will move to the gut microbiota part. So as you can see here, we are living with several microbiota that you can find in nostrils, in ears, on the skin, in, on penis, on vagina, on, in oesophagus, in mouth and also on the uh, uh, in the air on the head but the most important microbiota is the the intestinal microbiota in fact the intestinal microbiota is the most complex ecosystem in the human body and it's made up of bacteria viruses and fungi and you can see that the, my, your intestinal microbiota will represent one to two kilos of your body weight. It's 10 to the 14 microorganisms, which represent 
100,000 uh, billions of microorganisms. We can consider that we have identified around 1,000 species of intestinal microbiota, uh, bacteria, and we can also consider that we have as many bacteria as human cells in our human body. So the intestinal microbiota will vary along the gastrointestinal tract. And you can see, for example, in the stomach, you have a very low pH and you have a very low level of population of microorganisms. And you can see compared to the colon, for example, where the pH is much higher and much favorable to microorganisms, you can see that you will find 10 to the 11 cells per milliliters. You can see on this slide that the intestinal microbiota is an ecosystem that is gradually shaping itself. We can consider that at the birth, the, the baby is sterile, and then it will acquire a gut microbiota, and it will become adult at three years old. And it's probably the only one domain in our life where we are considered as adult at three years old, and you can see that at three years old, you have a huge increase of the bacterial diversity and a decrease of inter-individual variability. So the microbiota is a dynamic ecosystem which will vary all along our life. As I told you, uh, the, uh, the, the un unborn baby is considered as sterile, and then it will acquire uh, microbiota, which will differ depending on the delivery mode, depending on the uh, breastfed or formula fed. It will change uh, mainly after the winning when we move to solid food. And you can see after this in healthy toddler that use of antibiotics or malnutrition diet will have a, a huge impact on the composition of the microbiota. Same thing when you are adult and you are, uh, you can see the comparison between healthy and obese people, and you can see that the microbiota are quite different. And after this, at the end of your life, you have, you will have also a huge evolution of the composition of the microbiota. So now we can also uh, see that the composition of our microbiota will depend on, on uh, of our nutrition and we have a huge impact of the nutrition and the composition and the activity of the microbiota as you can see here if you are carnivores omnivores and herbivores the composition of your microbiota will be quite different so the intestinal microbiota can be considered as a one ecosystem which depends on food and here I, uh, I show you a comparison between the gut microbiota of Burkina Faso kids with low calories and a lot of fibers in their diet. And you can see that the composition of their microbiota will, uh, will be completely different from the European kids ones. As you can see with European kids, they will have a lot of calories, low fibers, and you can see that the distribution of the bacterial group groups is deeply modified between these two kids, two types of kids. <clears throat> so the roles of gut microbiota, it will play essential role in barrier functions, in metabolic functions, in immune functions. It will protect against pathogens like uh, bacteria or virus like rotavirus in, in, in babies. It will also play a role in the gut-brain axis. And here I have summarized some of the, uh, the diseases where we can see the gut microbiota playing a role, inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel syndrome, diabetes, arthritis, and autism. And this gut microbiota could be considered as a source of next generation probiotics rationally selected on the basis of human clinical data. So here, this term is Particularly, uh, particularly important in the medicine today because <clears throat> it, this biosis is the modification of the composition of the intestinal microbiota. So on the left side of my slide, 
you have a balanced situation where you have a good equilibrium between good bacteria and bad bacteria with a majority of good bacteria in contrast on the right uh, uh, panel of my slide you can see an unbalanced situation where we you will have a majority of what we called bad bacteria <clears throat> so these these biases are usually accompanied by a immunological dysregulation so on the upper panel of my slide you can see a eubiosis situation which is a balanced situation you have a good immunological equilibrium due to the good balance between good guys and bad guys in contrast on the lower panel of my slide you have an immunological disequilibrium which is called dysbiosis and in this case you will have a higher populations level of pathogens of uh, of uh, bad guys and this will induce inflama inflammation process so these dysbiosis of gut microbiota has been observed in many human diseases like antibiotic associated diary on rotavirus associated diary on crohn's disease on ulcerative colitis irritable bowel syndrome but also in obesity in diabetes and also in celiac disease so the dysbiosis could be also a good tool to select next generation probiotics so on the left panel of my slide you have the classical strategy in order to screen for novel traditional probiotic strain so you start from a panel of 50 to 100 candidates then you validate them in cellular and animal models and if you are lucky you will find one to three novel traditional probiotic strains on the right panel of my slide i have mentioned the dysbiosis strategy and in fact it will be much more simple so you just have to evidence a dysbiosis comparing the microbiota of healthy people and patients and this way you can identify for example a good bug which will be present in healthy people and absent in patients so you will uh, uh, suppose that this guy could be a good uh, bacterium and you will validate this hypothesis in cellular and animal models and we did this with fecali bacterium prosnitsi. We have identified it and we were able to show that FPROW is a very good next generation probiotics validated in cellular and animal models. So to conclude, the gut microbiota could be considered as a source of health innovation because it could be used to stratify population, to diagnose some diseases so it's a good diagnosis and stratification tool it could be considered as a source of novel molecules of health interest of novel next generation probiotics it could also be considered as a drug by itself through fecal transfer and you can also modulate the gut microbiota composition through food and or probiotics